Well, snowy enough for you? It was too snowy for our fragile little Bigfoot, as he's been sidelined with a sore throat. His voice is gone. It's the first time Biggie's ever been at a loss for words. That's why they had to send for me, Dr. Death, because I can't get sick. It's, well, it's too late for me to get sick anymore, if you know what I mean. I've got a story here about Dogman. Dogman marked my back porch as his turf. Dear Scary Stories NYC, Look, I've been dealing with an absolute jerk of a dogman for some time now. Don't bother me with questions of whether he exists. Only talk to me if you know about his weaknesses and vulnerabilities, because me and this dogman, we are at war. My wife learned to keep her cat inside after a narrow escape that introduced my family to this horrible monster. We've lived in this house for five years now, but it was only in 2020 when we first came to the realization that we have a major dogman problem. Some people say I should be working to gather evidence that this thing really exists, but why on God's green earth would I ever do a thing like that? Once this thing officially exists, I'll declare it an endangered species, and I won't be able to defend myself against it. Better to make it an extinct species first, then prove it used to exist second. Let me tell you about our first encounter with this nasty predator. The cat came running through the cat door so fast that it knocked its own food and water bowls flying as it raced madly inside losing its balance several times before succeeding in reaching one of its hiding spots. We were all still reacting to the big mess that the little cat had made when we saw something absolutely incredible and seemingly impossible. We saw the hairiest and the longest arm we'd ever seen reaching in through the cat door and feeling around for the cat. My wife screamed and did this dance, lifting her legs high in the air like she had rats at her feet. The fingernails or claws on this arm's fingers were so ridiculously long that they looked like something from a Hollywood monster movie. I grabbed a hammer and went over to smash the bones in the fingers of that hand to dust, but the creature must have had some kind of spidey sense because it withdrew its five-foot-long arm just before I could reach it. I was about to open the door and hammer that animal man in the face when my wife physically held me back. At the time I was annoyed with her, but I hadn't actually seen the dog man yet. I didn't even know it was a dog man. I thought it was some big hairy bruiser with extra long arms that was bothering my wife's cat. The arm and hand as hirsute as they were still looked more human than anything else, so I thought we were dealing with an oversized man. The next time we came into contact with the owner of that arm, we got a much better look at the entirety of the manimal. Too good a look in point of fact. My wife and I had just settled in to watch a movie in the house when we both heard a thumping sound on the back porch. We have a neighbor who visits us via the back way, so my wife got up to greet her friend. When she began screaming bloody murder, I ran to the back door to see what was the matter. My wife looked fine, but she was staring in shock and horror out the door at something I couldn't yet see. My mind flashed on the big bruiser with the five-foot-long arm who had tried to grab my wife's cat, and I grabbed a wine bottle to use for defense if need be. When I got to the door and looked outside, though, the bottle dropped from my shocked hand as I slammed the inner wooden door and triple-locked it. There was no man outside on our porch, and yet it was, in fact, the same big bruiser who had tried to grab the cat. I had mistaken him for a human because his arms and his chest really did resemble a man's body. A man's body, covered in thick fur, that looked like an orange-brown color in the dim lighting back there that night. 
It stood up like a man on its hind legs, but in nearly every other way, it was pure, savage animal. It was not a gorilla, though, and it was not a Bigfoot, assuming those are real. The legs were bent funny and resembled a deer's legs, so I know it was not a bear either. The head of the thing did have a snout that sort of resembled a bear, but to be honest, it looked a lot more like a dog's snout and head than a bear's. Do bears have triangular-shaped pointed ears like a wolf? The one I've seen had rounded ears, and this thing did not. When I looked at it, it looked at me. It was just standing there, looking at me in that instant. And I would have to say that this was a big boy. He looked down into my eyes, and I looked up into his. I'm six foot two. How tall was the dog man? I don't even want to guess. My wife and I ran up to the second floor where she called the police to report a prowler. I looked down at the dog man, trying to do so silently and not alert him to the fact that I was directly above him. For all I knew, the thing could climb walls and come get us. As I looked down onto this incredible scene, that dog man did his duty. Right there on my porch, I mean his big, brown, smelly pile of duty. If you catch my drift, we caught the drift of the odor wafting up from below, and I closed up the window. Well, the police failed to conceal their laughter at discovering nothing but the aforementioned back porch gift, and they asked us if we had any enemies. It was a humiliating experience being interrogated about this, but I don't blame my wife. If she hadn't called the cops, I probably would have, so whatever. As soon as they left, I threw a temper tantrum, swearing to my wife that I would get even with that obnoxious, dog-headed monster. She rolled her eyes and told me all she wanted me to do was take the smell somewhere and bury it. No, nope, I didn't save the poo to give to scientists. I don't really care if scientists believe in dogmen. That's not my cross to bear. Don't look to me to prove your pet theory. All I care about is my family and my home, and I will deal with this dogman in my own way. If he thinks he's clever, claiming my own house is his turf, my sons and I will educate this ignorant beast that all of the forest is man's domain. There is no place on this earth that we do not claim as ours. It is only by the grace of humanity's generosity that we allow the dogman species to continue existing at all. My second cousin showed up to our house panting as though he had been running. He told us he was hiking through the woods, behind the woods behind our house, not the forest immediately behind us, but over on the other side of the highway, on the federally protected land. That's where he saw the dogman, my dogman. He said it had orange-brown fur and walked on its hind legs, and it looked exactly the same as what I had been telling people had been harassing me and my family. And here's the best part. He said he saw the creature go into a cave. In other words, he found out where that dog man lives. I took him inside to my giant screen computer, and I opened Google Earth. Then we went searching for that cave, which we did not locate. My second cousin was, however, able to narrow down the general location of the place for me. I asked to see if any of my relatives or close friends were up on going on a monster hunt in the morning with me, and I found two big and strong buddies. In the morning, just as dawn struck, we set off on our adventure, GPS in hand, and bloody revenge in my heart. On the way, one of my buddies asked me why we were hunting a nocturnal animal in the morning. I asked him if you hunt a vampire at night or during the day. That only confused him. I explained, if my guesstimates were correct, we should reach Dogman Cave by late morning when the sun was highest in the sky. If we were lucky, that would be when the Dogman was in his deepest REM sleep. Even if we came with a brass band, we might not wake him up. It was, therefore, the safest time possible to hunt a dog man. And so, 
At 11.48 a.m., we found the cave. It was about a 30-foot climb up a not-so-steep embankment, just as my second cousin had said it would be. We climbed up to the entrance, finding it about five feet tall, big enough to walk into if you hunched over. One of my friends asked me if I wanted to go inside first, or if he should lead. I had no intentions of going inside the dog man's home, though. That wasn't the point of our journey at all. The dog man hadn't invaded my home, and I had no intentions of invading his. Rather than explain to either of my confused buddies, I dropped Trow, and I did my duty on the dog man's back porch. Now I know why you ate that burrito for breakfast before we left, said my friend laughing. I wasn't finding any of this amusing, though. I didn't then, and I don't now feel that this is a joke in any way. And that's why I did the same thing to the dogman that he had done to me. If I did any less, I would no longer be a man. And I tell you what, the dogman didn't give my poo to any scientists either. Me and that dogman, we don't care if you believe in either one of us. We don't need to involve anyone else in our little turf war. We are going to settle things mano a dog mano. And it's all because Dogman marked my back porch as his turf. It's a classic pull over, play with the scary stories, got it up. It's a classic pull over, but it ain't a stand up to go to go. A tail of all in white, black, navy, gray, or pink. Link is in the description. Dog Man in the Snowstorm Dear Scary Stories NYC, This literally just happened to me an hour ago and I had to tell you about it immediately. It's a Dog Man story, but one that you aren't going to believe. I'm stuck in this snowstorm in NYC. The buses aren't running in my neighborhood, and I just got lost snowblind in the worst part of the blizzard. But as hard as it was to see in the strong winds blowing snow in my eyes, I can tell you without any doubt in my heart that I personally witnessed a dogman walking through the storm on the same street as I was. That thing chased me through the storm and if not for the grace of God or fate or pure chance or whatever it was that saved me, I would not be alive to tell you this tale. First of all, I'm not a New York City native. I grew up in Yonkers, north of the city. I only moved here about a year ago to a neighborhood called Rosedale. It's way, way outside of the major parts of the city, which I didn't really understand when I moved in here just a few weeks before COVID struck. I lost most of my freelance work as soon as the lockdown started, and now I'm trapped out here until I can find a way to earn enough to move. I don't want to give you the impression that Rosedale in Queens is out in the boondocks because it isn't. It's paved streets and nice people. It's quite urban. My only complaint is how long it takes to get into Manhattan or Brooklyn where I would far rather be trapped. I mean where I would far prefer living. So I'm not mentioning this for pity, but it's probably important to note that as the snowstorm started I was feeling very deeply depressed and I had been trying to work my way out of it privately by listening to uplifting speakers like Eckhart Tolle on YouTube and by meditating. It worked enough to wake me up to the fact that it was snowing very hard outside the window. My phone went off with a weather alarm saying that the storm was turning into a bad one and that the mayor had canceled all buses. Roads were now for emergency vehicles only until tomorrow at 6 a.m dawned on me that I had nothing to eat in the apartment and that I better go out and find an open supermarket or pizzeria or something. Otherwise, it was macaroni and margarine for dinner and breakfast. Okay, 
Now you know too much about my personal life, and we haven't even gotten to the dog man part yet. Don't worry, he's in the green room now, getting ready for his close-up. So I got to the store I was hoping would be open, and spirits lifted. I got all the groceries I needed to subsist comfortably, even if the storm raged on for two days. I even remembered to bring my own shopping bags, and as I left the store, I was set to go and feeling fine. The wind was blowing harder now, and my clothes and shoes were getting soaked through. I was beginning to feel very cold, and yet I couldn't walk any faster than I already was. The sidewalks had been plowed a few hours earlier, and by then a thin, invisible layer of ice lay over the concrete. You couldn't tell where it would be slippery or not, so you had to take every step as though it might be your last. In some cases, the blocks where snow covered the sidewalks, sometimes two or three feet thick in the snowdrifts, were actually easier to navigate, even if they took a lot more effort to traverse. My arms were getting sore from being loaded down with groceries and being used to maintain balance. The winds and snow had gotten so extreme that not only could I no longer make out landmarks a few blocks away, I could barely see the buildings on the other side of the street any longer. I was beginning to panic and genuinely worry about my own safety. I put my head down and charged forward through the snow. In my tired and frightened state, my depression and self-pity returned, and my senses became dulled. I don't know where I made a wrong turn, but apparently I did. Looking left, right, forward, and back, I didn't recognize where I was. There are plenty of residential blocks in my neighborhood that I've never had any reason to walk down, so I tried to stay calm. I had made a left one block too soon or one block too late, so when I reached the next corner, I should be able to make a right turn onto my own street and be home after either a three or five block march, more or less. I calmed myself and focused on not falling on my butt. I had decided everything was fine, but when I reached the corner, the street sign bore a name unfamiliar to me. My hands were numb, my toes as well. My heart was beating fast and hard, but no blood seemed to be reaching my extremities. The situation was worsening as the day darkened to seem like the middle of the night. In my peripheral vision, I saw someone else walking in the snow. I had to get to that person. I had to ask them for directions. They would know. They probably lived out there all their lives. I called out to them, but the winds were too strong. I may as well have been whispering. Putting my head down and my back into it, I charged diagonally across the street toward the dark figure in the distance. I looked up occasionally to check that I was still heading toward the figure, and each time I discovered I was making good progress. Somehow, though, my stomach began to twist in a knot. When I'm worried, I get a stomach ache. Something about this man worried me, so I stopped and I gasped to catch my breath. I rested my groceries to relax my aching arms, and I squinted through the thick snowfall and the plumes of steam rising up from my own breathing. That man was too large. The man I was rushing towards was far too tall to possibly be real. Was I walking blindly toward a statue? I couldn't remember any statues in the area. How lost was I? As I stared at the figure, it soon became clear that it was moving. It was not a statue, but it was too tall to be a man. What else could be walking the streets of Queens, New York during a blizzard? The Yeti? He looked big enough to be a Yeti, and for some reason he seemed to have ears up on top of his head like Batman. It looked like a very dark hulk walking down the street, covered in fur and wearing a Batman mask. His eyes even glowed through the snow like Batman's do in the cartoons. I could even see them illuminate the snowflakes passing in front of and near to those eyes. Sounds of a very deep-voiced dog barking echoed from every direction all around me. Was a dog barking at that strange giant man? I saw steam rising from the man's face, showing me where the mouth and nose were and my mind whirled as I understood I was looking at a bipedal giant with the head 
of a canine-type creature. I watched as the incredibly tall man dropped to all fours, still seeming to be almost as tall as I was. The man wasn't being barked at. The man was a dog. The man-dog was the one barking. He was barking at me. I turned and ran, leaving my groceries where they were on the snowdrift. I couldn't make very good time on the snow and ice, and a large four-footed monster man was going to be able to catch up to me in no time. I felt the certainty of my own demise, which is about the worst feeling a person can have. It's like being sad and angry and depressed and motivated all at once. I felt hungry and nauseous and panicked and sleepy, and I went into a kind of robot mode, moving forward just on the off chance that I might get lucky and survive this incident. Better to run than not to, even though the chances of survival in either case were depressingly small. I heard the dog barking behind me and wondered how loud it must actually be. After all, my own shouts to the creature were muffled by the snow and winds. How large was that wolf-like thing? I would say ten feet tall when bipedal and five feet tall when on all fours, except that's absurd and impossible. If it actually were that absurd and impossible size, though, it would explain the painfully loud sounds of his bellows. This was a dogman with very large lungs. First, I barely noticed another sound besides the dogman, but soon I realized I was hearing a snowplow, one of the big trucks the city uses to plow the streets. It was ahead and to my left, and it was the closest thing to civilization I had to run toward. I remember screaming and racing toward the plow truck, knowing I might run myself right under the plow and do the dogman's work for him. Thankfully, and randomly, I blindly and accidentally came up on the side of the vehicle and the driver waved me to climb on in. He asked me if I was okay, and I actually told him I was running from a giant werewolf. I don't know why I said that to him. I was clearly in a bad state. I even tried to point the creature out to him, but I could no longer make him out in the storm. Maybe the dogman was intimidated by the snowplow. It was big and loud after all. I noticed the man eyeing me with a very wild surmise and so I dropped the dogman stuff and tried to act sane to calm him down. I remember asking him for directions and he nodded telling me to calm down. The kindly city worker resumed driving, taking me a few blocks closer to where I needed to be and a few blocks further away from the dogman. I lost my groceries, but I saved my life. Trade I would make again every time. As I sit here, eating macaroni and margarine, knowing I'm going to have to head back to that supermarket as soon as the snow lets up, I'm grateful to be alive and uninjured. As insane as the story seems to me, as much as it made me doubt my own sanity, I think there might be a rational explanation for it. Looking at Google Maps, I noticed that Rosedale in Queens is bordered on the south by Hook Creek Park which is a natural preserve. To our southeast is Idlewild Park, 160 acres of protected marshland. Plenty of fish and waterfowl for an oversized canine predator to dine on in both those places. There's also Brookville Park to our northeast. And as you see that as urban as we are, we are close by to some fairly untouched nature. Maybe I wasn't the only one who got snow blinded this morning. Maybe I wasn't the only one who got turned around and lost in the snow. Maybe that's the explanation for Dog Man in the Snowstorm. Don't touch that dial. We've got a story of Dogman walking right onto a man's private property coming up in a second. But first, I'd like to drop my new rhyme, yo. Thank you, our dear Nicole Gomez. It's true your heart is where your home is. She's a person full of soul. Her last name's Gomez. First, 
Nicole. Please join us in thanking Nicole Gomez for making this episode possible. In return, we send her links to watch our secret, uncensored Sunday Night Dogman stories too wild to ever be told on this channel. You can see them too by joining our PayPal Subscribers Club at peterbernard.com or by doing what Nicole Gomez did and clicking the join link under this or any of our videos. And now, for more of what Nicole wants to hear. Another Dogman story, and we call this one... Dogmanus Interruptus Dear Scary Stories NYC, I lived through the scariest dogman encounter ever, and I don't think I'll ever forget it. It was a chilly autumn night, in the woods of northern Michigan, and I was driving down County Highway 557, which is an unlit two-lane highway, zipping through forests and fields around Cornell, Michigan. I was passing sort of by the Gwynn State Forest area on my way home from a long day of work, and I was tired. I'd been speeding along for hours, and I was eager to get home. As I drove deeper into the forest, I began to feel uneasy. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The woods were dark and foreboding, and I couldn't see anything beyond the headlights of my car. I tried to reassure myself that it was just my imagination, but I couldn't get the notion out of my head. When I'm nervous, I feel like I have to pee. Same thing when I'm cold. This was a cold night where I was feeling nervous, so I decided I'd better find a spot somewhere on this dark road where I could hop into the woods and hydrate some of the vegetation. After what seemed an eternity of driving, I finally saw a spot where I could pull off the asphalt to relieve myself. I got out of the car and trotted quickly a short distance into the woods, hopping up and down to prevent anything happening too soon. As it was finally doing my business, and feeling a most intense sense of relief, I heard a strange noise that erased all that. It was a low growling sound, and it seemed to be coming from behind me. The trouble was, that growling sound made me nervous, and the more nervous I got, the more I had to pee. The more I did my business, the more the growling behind me intensified, which in turn made me even more nervous when I finally finished I then had to repackage everything downstairs, and I kept praying that if I continued acting nonchalant, the growling animal would either go away or maybe fall asleep from boredom. I turned around and found that neither was the case. I looked and I saw the most terrifying thing I had ever seen. It was a huge, eight-foot-tall, upright canine. Its eyes glowed golden yellow in the dark, and its teeth gleamed greenish off-white in the moonlight. It was like a werewolf from a movie, but a good movie, not something made in the last ten years. The nasty-smelling beast man growled again, and I knew I had to get back to my car as fast as possible. I ran deeper into the woods, trying to throw the dog man off my trail, then doubled back around to my car as fast as I could. Wherever I went, the dog man chased me. It was incredibly fast and it seemed to be gaining on me with each step. I reached my car just in time, and I jumped in, slamming the door shut behind me. I turned the key in the ignition, and of course, it didn't start. I saw the dog man emerging from the woods, and I prayed before trying it a second time, promising I would go to church every Sunday for a month if it started. It started, and as I hit the gas to drive away from that lonely, smelly place. I was already starting to negotiate with God in my mind, like maybe could I break those four Sundays up over the course of a year or two? But the terror wasn't over yet. The dog man didn't give up that easily. It chased my car down the road for what seemed like well over a mile, increasing speed as I did, then keeping up with my car, even though I was driving at the speed limit. It only stopped when I finally reached a main road and the dog man vanished into the woods. I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't made it to my car in time. All I know is that I lived through 
the scariest dogman encounter ever, and I'll never forget it. Story number two, the Dogman Church Fight. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I lived through the scariest dogman story ever. It happened a few years back when I was driving down Route 421 through Madison, Indiana, on my way back from visiting a friend out of town. It was getting late and the road was quiet with few cars around. As I drove near the Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge, I saw something that I will never forget. Two massive creatures, each seven feet tall or taller, were engaged in some kind of altercation in front of a white church by the road. They both looked like a cross between a dog and a man, and each of them had long shaggy fur covering their bodies. It was as if I stumbled upon something from another world. At first, I couldn't believe my eyes and thought it was a prank or a special effect from a movie shoot. We're talking about two dog-headed werewolves, basically. I don't even know if a human could have recreated that scene or two humans in costumes. I don't think the anatomy was human anatomy. and I was fascinated, but also more than a little scared. I just wanted to get past them somehow and move on. I tried to drive around them, but as I did, they both turned their animosity toward me and my car. I could sense their hostility, and it felt as if they wanted to tear me apart. One of them started running toward my car, and the other followed closely behind. In that moment, I felt a rush of adrenaline that surged through my veins. My only instinct was to floor the gas pedal and escape as fast as I could. The car roared as I peeled out and began to outrun them. I could hear their howls of rage. It was like being in a nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. I kept my eyes glued to the road ahead, trying not to glance in the rearview mirror and prolong the terror. I had never driven so fast in my life. And after what felt like an eternity, they began to look smaller in the rearview mirror and I knew that I had outrun them for the time being. I stopped the car at the nearest gas station and tried to calm myself down. My hands were shaking, and my heart felt like it was about to leap out of my chest. I thought to myself, what on earth just happened? I will never forget that night. I don't know what those creatures were, but I know for sure they were not normal animals. They were something beyond comprehension something that should have never existed. Whenever I drive down that road at night, I can't help but feel a shiver down my spine and remember that terrifying encounter. Story number three, Dog Man Turf War in Swamp Lake. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I lived through the scariest dog man encounter ever even though it started out as the perfect getaway for this overworked professional. I have always been fascinated with nature, and camping in Swamp Lake State Natural Area in Wisconsin been on my bucket list for years. Finally, I decided to take the plunge and head out on a camping adventure in July of last year. I won't get into details, but I severely needed some time off just to myself and nobody else. Upon arriving, I was struck by the sheer beauty of the place. The lush greenery, the towering trees, and the serene lake all left me in awe. As I set up my tent, I couldn't help but notice the abundance of wildlife around me. From chipmunks scampering around to birds chirping in the trees, the entire area was buzzing with life. The trees were a mix of towering pines and smaller deciduous trees. There were ferns, wildflowers, and grasses of all sorts that seemed to emanate a sweet, earthy smell. The air was warm and thick, causing beads of sweat to form on my forehead. As the afternoon faded into evening, the sights, sounds, and smells shifted. The sky turned to shades of pink and orange as the sun dipped below the horizon. The sound of crickets chirping lingered in the air, punctuated by the occasional croak of a frog and the rustling of trees in the breeze. As the night wore on, the forest seemed to come alive. I heard the rustling of leaves and twigs, 
undoubtedly the sound of small animals foraging for food. Occasionally I'd hear the hoot of an owl or the howl of a distant coyote. These sounds were eerie, yet at the same time comforting as they let me know I wasn't entirely alone. At one point I sat at the edge of the lake, staring out at the mirror-like surface. The only sounds were the water lapping at the shore and the occasional call of the loons. As much as I enjoyed the solitude and silence, I couldn't help but feel a little on edge, as if I was intruding on a world that wasn't meant for me. That night I awoke in my tent at a loud sound, but in my sleepy state I wasn't sure what I had heard. It sure sounded to me like a pack of dogs were fighting in my camp, just outside my tent, but what was the likelihood of something like that happening? When the sounds of fighting just kept going on and on, I decided I'd better unzip the tent, just enough so I could look out there. My heart was racing as I peeked out into the darkness, trying to process what I was seeing. These weren't your grandpa's dogs fighting out there. They were half-human, half-canine creatures, and they were tearing at each other like they were fighting for survival. I couldn't quite make out the faces in the dark, but their silhouettes were unmistakable. I'd heard stories of werewolves or dogmen, but I never imagined I would see them in real life. Pulling my head back into the tent, I took a shot of whiskey I brung with me in case I see impossible things outside my tent. But even after I took a good belt, I could still hear those inconvenient dogmen outside continuing to be real and in the same world that I was in. My mind raced with questions. Were they honestly out there? Were they dangerous? Should I call for help? I knew I shouldn't have come alone, but it was too late for regrets now. I unzipped the tent a bit to get a view of the battle. As the fighting continued, I noticed that one of them pushed the rest off and ran away into the dense woods. The others howled in frustration and anger as they watched it go. One of them, the biggest of the pack, let out a blood-curling snarl before turning back to face the others. The three remaining wolfmen circled each other, growling and baring their teeth, sizing each other up, waiting for an opportunity to attack again. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I knew I had to make a decision quickly. I quickly zipped up my tent, hoping they didn't hear me. I knew that I had to leave Swamp Lake State Natural Area as soon as possible. I began packing my things quietly and as quickly as I could. I didn't want to risk making any noise that would draw their attention. Suddenly I heard rustling outside my tent. My heart stopped as I imagined one of the wolfmen sniffing around for me. Peeking out just enough to see, I saw one of the wolfmen circling my tent as if it knew I was there. I froze, not knowing what to do. It was then that the wolfmen stopped circling and simply walked away into the woods. They seemed to have reacted to my presence by simply moving their business elsewhere. That was not what I was expecting to be certain. I mean, they just acted like this was no longer a good place to have a turf war, like I'd ruined everything by camping on their personal battlefield. I waited a few more minutes, and they seemed to have actually left. Quickly, I grabbed my belongings and headed out of the park, looking back over my shoulder the entire way out of there. I know this is the scariest dogman encounter of all time, and I made it through alive with nobody's help but my own. Man, yo. Story number four, West Virginia Werewolf Man. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I'm going to tell you about the scariest thing that ever happened to me, and in fact, I'm sure it's the scariest dogman experience of all time. 
I was driving north on Route 11 in the middle of a dark night, having just left Virginia and now finding myself following my grandmother's directions, driving on a one-lane unlit road going through the woods of West Virginia. They don't call it Route 11 locally, though. There, it's called Big Oak Tree Road. That's because it's named after a big guy named Oakland Tree who built the first one-lane road to hell in the USA. Do you believe me? You shouldn't. No, obviously, it's called Big Oak Tree Road because it's lined with oak trees on both sides. I was just testing to see if you were still awake because you're going to need to be paying attention to follow this one. This is something that happened to me back in the early 90s. And it's the scariest dogman encounter story you're ever going to hear. So this road was barely wide enough for me to fit on, and I was nervous about traffic coming up at me from ahead or traffic coming up faster than me from behind. I kept checking for space on the sides where I could pull off, especially if the road got even a little bendy. I was paranoid about getting into an accident, and then... All of a sudden, without any warning at all, as I was about to go up a slight incline, the car just clicked off and sputtered out. It made a sound like my grandmother, the cigar smoker, used to make when she first got up in the morning. This sort of wet, wheezing, coughing noise. And then that car engine went as still and quiet as a mob victim buried in a New Jersey swamp. I was more than a little surprised and I didn't even know the car was sick, let alone ready to pass out. When I couldn't restart the engine, I got out to look under the hood. Of course, that was when a car came rolling along, only to find me blocking the road in front of him. At first he beeped, then he got out and came over to see what the problem was. He spoke in a nervous manner, twitching like a method, and twisting his legs as though he had to go to the bathroom or something. He asked me what was wrong, and I told him that my car stopped running in the middle of the road. That was not the answer he wanted to hear, and he informed me of this several times over, each time with the greater emphasis on the word not. He seemed to be trying to intimidate me, so I looked him directly in the eye, and I very quietly told him that I didn't care what he wanted to hear. I only cared about the truth. Now the guy flipped out into a rant about how he already knew everything I said before I said it. Then he stopped on the ground a few times and he asked me if I even knew what information was. I was trying to figure out what was wrong with my car, and this guy was asking me to define the concept of information. When I didn't answer, he answered for me. If a sentence contains no new information, he insisted, then it has no novelty, and that was me, he said. I had no novelty, because I spoke, but I said nothing. Just like all the politicians he voted against. Then he started ranting about politics. I still had no idea what was wrong with my car, but I noted that it had stopped smoking. That might be a good thing, indicating that it might have cooled down, or it might mean that the heap is deader than ever. The guy was still ranting about equations proving something about information or disproving it when I interrupted to ask him if he knew what was wrong with my car. That actually shut him up for a second, and he stared at me, wide-eyed, through completely dilated pupils. I asked the freak again if he knew anything about cars, reasoning that if he could get my car running, I could get out of his way. Well, at first I thought I had offended him, and that he was throwing some kind of tantrum. But then I realized it was more like the poor guy was having a fit, like a mental spaz out or something. I don't know what to call it. I'm not a hospital worker, but this guy was shaking all over. He was still screaming, only now, instead of screaming about semantics, he was screaming out in pain. And then the weirdo started cracking and bending in wrong directions. It looked like a human special effect, but I wasn't sure what movie I was watching a scene from. It felt like my eyes were being tickled from the inside when I would try to look directly at the guy, and I wasn't really sure what I was seeing happen in front of me. Then he started laughing, right? But this crazy kind of laughter, not anything healthy or normal. And this time when I looked at him, I seen that his ears have gone all pointed. 
and he's a lot hairier than before. I asked him, Mister, are you okay? But obviously he wasn't, and I was so scared I felt nauseous. I went and sat in the car so I could watch him, but not get any of his bodily fluids on me, as he seemed to be having the strangest epileptic fit in history. And then, I swear, the next time I saw that nutcase, he had a long dog snout, and he was covered in silver fur all over. He looked like a human version of a wolf, but with much shaggier fur than a wolf is supposed to have. He howled like a werewolf in a movie, and charged off into the woods, leaving me alone, sitting there in my dead car. I sat there, listening to the crickets for a while. Then I turned and looked back at the Freakazoid's car. Its door was open, and the lights were on inside. It didn't seem like it would hurt anything, if I just checked to see if Captain Canine left the keys in the ignition or not. Well, what do you know? The guy who couldn't think straight left the keys right where I needed them. I got into his crate, started it up, put her in reverse, and backed up to the closest area where I could make a U-turn. Then I drove down to some place in Virginia. I think it was maybe Hancock or Berkeley Springs. I forget. But I found a phone and got a garage to tow my car in. Then I drove the Nutter's car over to the garage, and the rest is boring. But nothing leading up to that ending was, and that's because you just listened to the scariest dogman story of all time. Anna White is who we want to thank for sending us something to put in the bank. Please join me in thanking Anna White, who sent us a generous super thanks last night, and thereby made this episode possible today. You too can send us a super thanks by clicking that thanks button under this or any of our YouTube videos. And in so doing, you buy us a meal, or maybe you buy my cat some cat food, or maybe I can buy a potato at Trader Joe's. Whatever it is, it's more than we've got right now, and we appreciate everyone who can help. So thanks, Anna White. Here to explain how you too can be as cool as Anna White is our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Hank. Thanks, Biggie. And thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button. Or join our PayPal subscribers club at peterbernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 LaScary. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after, I think, three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Come back, come back for more scary, scary stories. stories.